Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Photo Joseph's Photo Moment. As always, if you want to skip past the morning pleasantries, just scroll on down into the chat description or into the show description. There will be a link to take you to the straight to the beginning of the actual show. So it looks like the chat room's been a little busy this morning. <laughs> I think the first person logged in here an hour ago. You guys are crazy. Although I did see there is some little time shift. Uh, time zone, what do you call it? Uh, daylight savings time confusion. So uh, I thank you all for being here so incredibly early. That is just too awesome. Today's show, of course, is all about answering the questions that have been the, the bigger questions over the last week that um, that I didn't really feel like typing out, that I thought would be more better addressed here in person on the show. So that's what we're going to be doing. So good morning again to everybody in there. I'm just going to scroll back a little bit in here and see who is already in the room. Some of you may have already taken off already. I have no idea. But we got Martin. Good morning. We got Faked Cube. We've got Nathan. We've got Serge. We've got, uh, let's see, here's Martin again. There's a little conversation going back and forth between the three of you guys. I guess he was, you were the three early ones here. Scrolling down, scrolling down, scrolling down, scrolling down. Okay, now we get into the newer stuff. My goodness, and of course, Ryan is in there taking control of the room. Behave yourselves, he'll throw you out in a moment's notice. Uh, let's see here, God, you guys are really busy this morning. Extender01, good morning from the Czech Republic, or good evening, I suppose, to the Czech Republic. And Jess and Alphonse, hello from Liechtenstein. Wow, that is crazy awesome. Denmark is in here again as well. Mr. or Miss God Autumn is in here as well. Excellent, and Sean, good morning to you, Sean. All righty. Lots of great, uh, lots of great names and folks, and seeing good to see you all in here again. Okay, so hey, as usual, if you want to catch my attention, because there are clearly a lot of uh, there's a lot of activity in the chat room already, and I expect this uh, th this will continue. If you want to get my attention, two ways to do it: just at Photo Joseph. That'll put a red bar on there, so I know that you are trying to talk to me. Um, or if you really want to get my attention, there's that little super chat button, which uh, which works out pretty well as well. So either one of those will definitely definitely get my eyes on whatever it is you are saying. So let's uh, let's just get this thing officially started, shall we? Good morning and welcome to Photo Joseph's Photo Moment, the first live daily photo show on the YouTubes every weekday, 9.30 a.m. Pacific. Even when the time shifts because of time uh, time zone, not time zone, what are they called? Uh, daily savings time changes. We still do it at 9.30 my time, so sorry for those who have been confused by the live time, but it'll all sort itself out one of these days. One of these days, we'll just ban daylight savings time, and we'll all go to UTC time, and we'll have universal time. It'll be a glorious thing. Of course, that's probably not going to happen in any of our lifetimes, but hey. When the alien civilizations come down that are smarter than us and they tell us what to do, that's when it'll happen. All right, so uh, before I get into the questions, there has been a lot of chatter on my comments, even in the chat room here this morning, about this supposed story, we're just gonna call it a story, um, about Panasonic and, oh my God, what's happening to the camera division? So here's all I can tell you right now. I have read th the the things that are posted on Michael Forther's rumors and other websites are all that. They're rumors, speculation, and dare I say it, fake news. Everything stems out of one story on a Nikkei website, which itself was speculation based off of the only official statement that came out of Panasonic. And I saw someone said bad timing with the GH5. It wasn't bad timing. The Pan this Panasonic statement was all the way back in September of last year, and it was simply about a restructuring. Companies do restructuring all the time. This is not any big deal. It has nothing to do with the camera manufacturing process themselves, the camera, um, the camera division, is is being or has been, or I'm not sure how. The, I have no idea if this has actually happened or not, or if it's going to happen. But moved under another division. That's it. It's like saying marketing. You now report to this department instead of that department. That's all it is. So for all the crazy rumors out there, my theory is that it's some competition who got pissed off that the GH5 is doing so well before it's even on the market. And they decided to spread some nasty grams around. Other than that, that's it. That's all we've got. It's whatever you're reading is all fake news. The only only thing that came out of Panasonic was all the way back in September. It had nothing to do with what people are talking about. So there you go. We're going to leave it at that. Okay. Now let's get on with the questions of which there are many. Scroll down. I'm going to just do these in chronological order again. Uh, so we're going to be bouncing around all over the place a little bit. So the first one. Uh, is actually, it's not a question, it's, it was a clarification that came from Epifan. So remember for a while I was doing, uh, I did a few tests with that Epifan 4K streamer, the Pearl 2 streamer, this crazy awesome $8,000 
kind of expensive, but not really when you dig into it. Uh, streaming hardware, the switching, there's all kinds of cool stuff. And one of the, the limitations that I'd run into when I was testing with it, and we'll put a link to, we, we should make, if we don't have a playlist, we'll make one, we'll put a link to it right here um, so you can get and see all the Epifan Pearl 2 stuff. Uh, one of the limitations that I run into was that when you're when you're building your encode, uh, you, you, sorry, when you're building your stream, you can send your stream out to multiple destinations at once. You can send it to YouTube, to Facebook, to yeah, I don't know your your own CD and whatever. You can send it out to multiple places at once. The problem was that you could only encode it one size. So, for example, let's say I'm doing a 1080p show to YouTube, I'd be outputting 1080p to YouTube, but Facebook can only handle 720p, and if you send them 1080p, they do the downsampling, and we know from experience that they choke on it, the signal looks worse than if you send it 720, and it also has a tendency to drop, sputter, stall, have issues. So. Epifan had come back and said a way around this would be to have, if you were using an external switcher like I am here, like I'm using my, um, my, uh, my, my, what is this thing called? My ATAM from Blackmagic, that I could feed that into the Perl and then have the Perl do two completely different programs. And a program is basically a whole different show. But because the show is being handled, all the switching is being handled externally, then I could do one show at 720p for Facebook, one at 1080p for YouTube, and, you know, whatever you want. And that, that's okay, as long as you're doing an external thing, but it doesn't solve the problem if you're doing your switching internally. So if you're just using the Perl, you're doing everything there, it's not a solution. Turns out there is a solution. Epifan came back again and said, aha, we found another way to do this. And this is really cool. So essentially what you would do is you would build your entire program at whatever system, let's say you're doing 4K even, doesn't matter, but you've got a program that's set up and this is for YouTube, you do all my switchings in there, I've got all my presets, you guys saw all that, do picture in picture and um, lower third titles and cropping in and all that cool stuff. So I do all of that and then I set my streaming output to go to YouTube and then I set another streaming output that is just kind of a generic output stream. Now I build another program and I grab the output stream from the first program, feed it into the second, and this is all just done in software, there's no cabling to do, feed it into the second and that second program can go out at 720p. This is a really, really cool and powerful solution because it means you can stream to multiple destinations with totally different resolutions and I think it's a really, really clever way to handle it. And I don't, I don't recall if there even is a limit, what the limit would be to how many programs you can make, but you can certainly do multiple programs. So it's a really neat solution for that. So if you're looking at the Perl 2 and you're looking at streaming to multiple CDNs, content delivery networks, that require different resolution inputs, then contrary to what was popularly confirmed by Perl, uh, by Epifan, you do actually have a way to do that. So that is story number one, if we call it a story. Question number one, statement number one, whatever. Okay, now let's move on. Let's see, no questions flying by with my name attached to them, so I'm just going to keep on going here. All right, next one up, Mr. Richardson Twain says, uh, here we go, says, I hope all is well, I am confused. I'm thinking of buying the GH5 later this year, waiting for the rush to be over, no worries there. Um, has a couple questions about lenses. First one was, will the Sigma 18 to 35 and the 50 to 100, 50 to 100 art lens work with the GH5? No reason that it shouldn't. Uh, I have not personally tested those. I did bring out my one Sigma lens. This is the Art, uh, what is this one? This is the, I forgot, 60 mil F2.8 Art lens. So I brought this out along with my GH5 just so I could put it on here, push the button, don't fall over, and um, show that it worked. I actually have not attached this to it yet, so I figured, hey, what the hell, let's do this live on air. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> All right, so we're turn this thing on, switch it into photo still mode, and look at that, and uh, oh, I got self timer on and bracketing to address another question here, and it takes a picture. It works. It, I don't know what else to tell you. It works. There's no reason in the world it shouldn't work. Things like the Metabones, which is also on this question, whether that works or not, that's a different story because those are uh, kind of being built outside of the scope of what Panasonic supports and does. So those things are left up to those manufacturers, but there's no reason in the world Sigma dedicated micro four thirds lenses will not work on the GH5. Now, as we have talked about before, the best autofocus and image stabilization performance is going to be on native Panasonic lenses, but that doesn't mean the other ones don't work. So, okay, so there's that first, first part of the question. Uh, he also asked, what adoption is there apart from the Metabone speed booster? I do not know what that question means, so if you're watching this, Richardson, uh, Clarify that, please. And then he says, and this is the tough one. And this is, and the reason I put this question up here instead of just answering that Sigma one is obviously yes, um, is because this is a this is a larger discussion. He says, if I get these lenses and lists a couple of lenses, will I need any more? Will these cover all of my needs? 
I get a lot of questions about what lenses should I buy? And usually the question ends there, <laughs> which doesn't really help me much. Uh, what lens should I buy? Well, if that's the extent of your question, then all of them. Um, and that's not, Richardson did put a proper question here, but I don't need to go into the lenses he listed. The lens that's right for you is gonna be different for everybody. Um, oh, Ryan's saying you think he's asking if there are different adapter options, not like the Metabone Speed Booster. That is a unique thing. There are other adapters out there to adapt other third-party lenses to Micro Four Thirds. I have zero experience with any of them, but they do exist. But the Metabones, what they do with their Speed Booster is unique, as far as I know, unique to them. Okay, so what lens do you need or what lenses do you need? It just depends on what you're doing. There's no easy answer to this. If you're looking for a just gen, very general cover all the bases, what am I gonna get started with lens? If you wanna buy one lens, that new 12 to 60 f2.8 to f4 is a beautiful lens. Uh, it's a little slower on the long end, right at f4, but because that is equivalent of 120 millimeter at f4, you do still get nice bokeh with that if you're reasonably close to your subject. If your subject is, you know, you're shooting a mountain range, obviously it's, everything's going to be in focus. But uh, it is a very good, very sharp, very fast, uh, fabulous image stabilization, really, really good all-purpose lens. If you're gonna buy two lenses and you want something a little faster, my recommendation always has been and probably always will be to pair up the 12 to 35 f2.8 and the 35 to 100 f2.8. So that's this lens here and then the longer version, it's, it's on the other camera, so I can't grab it now. But then you have the full range of 12 to 100 or in full frame, form, uh, full frame equivalent, uh, 24 up to 200 millimeter at f2.8 all the way through. And that is a fantastic, fantastic pairing. When I shoot video, those are the two primary lenses that I shoot with. Unless I'm doing something in really, really low light, those are the two that I go out with all the time. They cover a very broad range. You have a fixed aperture all the way through, which I really, really like. Um, just in general, great, great lenses. No question about it. There's Mark II versions of these lenses coming out. So that means you're gonna have the new stabilization built into the new versions of the lenses. If you do not have access, if you already own the old lenses, do you need to upgrade? No, we've talked about this in the past. Uh, the, obviously you can, you know, certainly by all means, Panasonic would be thrilled if you did, but the gains of the new lenses is the improved weather proof slash freeze proofing. So if you're shooting in really inclement conditions, you might want to consider the upgrade and also better stabilization because the new versions have the built-in Mark II version stabilization. And that will gain you about a half a stop to a full stop difference on the GH5 compared to the older lenses. So if that's not a super critical thing for you, don't upgrade. If it is a super critical thing to you, upgrade. And if you're in the market to buy it today, obviously I'm going to recommend you buy the new lenses, but there's a used market, which is always a great way to go as well, as long as you can, you know, you're, you know you're buying lenses that haven't been dropped. Um, but the used market's great. So that's my general, those are the lenses that you should get. Everybody should get if you're doing, if you're just looking for general purpose. But if that's not what you, you know, you're not looking for the zooms, you want faster primes, then it really depends on your focal length. What do you like? Personal favorites? The Leica 15mm f1.7 is one of my favorite street photography lenses. It's a little on the wide side, but I like for street photography, I like to get up close, so that is a wonderful, wonderful lens. The 25mm f1.4 is always a good option, so nice, fast 50mm equivalent. Of course, there's the Noctocron, the 42.15, insane lens. Quite pricey, but very, very, very good quality lens, so that's a good one. And then you got the third party ones, like the one that I, I don't have it here, but the one that I, I killed, <laughs> this Yongyi one, which by the way, they did get back to me. They want pictures of what I've done to it, so I gotta send that to them today, so hopefully they can fix it. Uh, but there are third party lenses, right? That's a 25 millimeter F with 0.95. That is a lens that I love for really low light. I've done some video in super low light with that, which came out looking so cool. Of course, your depth of field is, you, know, you really gotta nail focus, but with focus peaking on the camera, so many options. So there's just, there's incredible options out there. There's no easy answer to it. So I hope that that non-answer helps you. Uh, let me see here, let me go back. There's a couple things that flew by with my name on it. Fuse says, uh, he might be asking if he can use the Sigma 18 to 35 with the speed booster on the GH5. Oh, that's possible. Um, if he uses the Ultra, it might work, but the lens is made for APC, not for full frame, so the XL won't work. So there, I just read what he said. I have absolutely zero idea what if that's true or not. I'm sure it's true. I'm, making, I'm giving Fuse a hard time. He, Fuse has got all kinds of good information on this. Um, I just don't have any experience with it. And so that really is a question to go back to Metabones. And I know right now, if you ask him compatibility with the GH5, they will, if they even bother to respond, they will say, we will be testing as soon as we have one. That's all they've told me. So that's what they're telling you. 
Um, Marvin asked about low light, so video lens for low light. I think the ones that I just went through, uh, you know, obviously the the bigger the aperture, the better for low light. That's just no arguing. There's no two ways about that. And in a fixed focal length lens, you're going to get faster apertures than you would on a zoom lens. That's just a universal truth. So get that uh, that 25 f1.4 if you want that 50 millimeter focal length. If you want the wider, there's the Leica. If you want them longer, there's the the Noctocron. Uh, lots of different options in there, but that's kind of that's where I generally uh, stay within. So. Hopefully that helps. Okay, that's that question. Let's move on now. Uh, let's see, was there anything else with my name on it? There was not. Okay. Uh, Miro Nick asked a couple of GH, a lot of questions actually, comparing the GX8. So he says, uh, I'm using a GX8 and thinking to upgrade to the GH5. My usage is 80% stills, 20% 4K video, 20 to 30% of that is for clients and the rest for private use. I have a couple of questions. So all of that, actually, the usage is kind of irrelevant to the specific questions. All right, question number one, what's the buffer size for raw shooting on the GH5? I'm using Lexar UHS-2 cards, if this is important. I had to Google this, I didn't know, I can't found an article on The Verge that said, and I'm, I have no reason not to believe it, The Verge is good, the GH5 has a 100 image raw buffer built into the camera. That's kind of a lot. I have no idea what high-end Canons or Nikons have, but that sounds like a lot to me. So I'm going to go with, <laughs> that's a lot. Uh, as far as the card, the faster the card that you have, the faster that buffer can clear. All right. So when you take a picture, the first place it goes is into the camera's buffer, and then it gets written to the card. And so if you have a slower card, whether you're shooting stills or video, and to some degree, that high-speed card is actually more relevant to shooting stills if you're shooting rapid fire sequence shooting you know 10 frames a second you're getting all these shots that have to get into the card that's more data than you're getting even with the uh, the uhd so 4k 60p video so you do want those fast cards so the the question then if it becomes not what is the buffer but how quickly will the buffer clear that i don't have an answer to that is going to be dependent on the card from the manufacturer they all have their ratings and what they're rated ratings are always maximum transfer speeds uh sometimes you actually get a spec that says a sustained transfer speed but there's so many variables in there that it really has to be tested on a card by card basis but with a 100 uh, raw buffer built into the camera that's going to take care of most of your situations, even if you have a slower card. You may just have to wait longer for the buffer to clear before it's completely cleared and you can actually remove the card, which you might have seen last week when I was shooting with the focus stacking and I was shooting raw. It took a while to clear the buffer for the card to get written to because I'm not using the new fast cards. I'm using older cards. So definitely a reason to upgrade your cards there. Okay, before I go on to questions two, there are other things with my name flying by. Let's see, Sim says, let's see, Simban says, uh, slightly off topic, uh oh. Okay, the restructuring thing I addressed at the beginning of the show, so you're going to have to uh, have to watch that. Um, I will just say fake news. In the words of our dear leader, fake news. Uh, let's see here. Chris Addy is saying, wanting to know if it will be possible with a software update that will that it will capture slow motion at 400 megabit per second. Is that would make a much cleaner resolution than at 180 frames per second? I don't know. Uh, all I know is what's been made public already that you're going to get a 400 megabit at what is it? I don't even remember now. 4K. Six, is it 60? I honestly, I don't even remember. I don't know if that's going to apply to the slow motion. So sorry, I, I don't have an answer for you there. Uh, and I think that we won't have an answer until that is closer to release, I think is what the, what that really comes down to. Okay, next up, uh, continuing on with Miro's questions. Uh, number two says, is the GH5 also lowering the EVF, that's the electronic viewfinder, resolution when shooting in AF continuous at a high frame rate? So compared to the GX8, I had no idea what he was talking about. I had to look. It does. It does lower the resolution. I had to put it. So I put the camera in the autofocus continuous, put it into the high frame shooting rate, look through the camera, hold the button down. And sure enough, the EVF resolution does lower while that's being while you're shooting. So it's interesting. I, I think that um, I'm well, obviously there's it's, it's simply a power issue, but by lowering the resolution, it must allow the higher refresh rate so you can still maintain tell that you're maintaining focus, even though the resolution is lower and track your your image in the scene. So that's um, that's it. I mean, the answer is yes. That's that's the simple answer. It does do the same thing as uh, as it did before. Number three was how long is the blackout time for the EVF in comparison to the GX8? That's something that would have to be measured either by Panasonic or some independent lab. Looking through the viewfinder, they feel the same, but you know we we're talking about milliseconds here, so I I can't measure that. Sorry. Uh, number four, this is a great one. Can you combine exposure bracketing with a two-second self-timer for night shooting? In the GX8, these settings share the same menu. So the answer is yes. I had to try this out. So on the GH5, let's go ahead and... Oh, what happened to my switcher here? 
Uh, hope that's the right one. There we go. On the GH5, you have. Wait for that to turn. There we go. You have on the top dial here uh, your control for your single exposure, multiple uh, high frame rate, and so on, 6K photo, and all these other ones. And then you have your self timer mode. So the self timer mode on the GH5 is dedicated to this dial here. So then on the modes on the back, when you switch it up to, uh, to do bracketing, you can combine bracketing with the self timer. And so that's if you saw when I took the picture with this lens, there was a pause and then it fired three shots because that's what it was set up for. So you can do that. So right now it is set for this. So just to, I mean, you just, you just hear the shots. You're going to hear it. It says, let's just do this. I didn't hook this one up to the to the setting. So let's see here. If we go, oops, I must hit the display button. Come back here. Come here. There we go. Um, there you can see in the bottom it says bracketing. Right, and if I push the button, we're gonna get a two second timer and then boom, 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 there's three shots. I set it to do a three frame sequence just to test it. So yeah. so yes, the answer to your question is yes, you can do that, which is great. So the advantage of that, in case you're wondering, is if you're doing long exposure bracketing and you don't wanna have, uh, you know, connect your phone app to it or connect a wired remote to it, you want to be able to push the button, get your hands off the camera, let the camera stop moving before it fires the sequence. So you can do that with the GH5. So good. Uh, next question, Nick, Miro Nick had a lot of questions here. When using the custom modes, and this is a really good question because this is a, a misunderstanding of the custom modes. His question says, when using the custom modes C1 through three, is the GH5 also losing the change settings when turned off? I use the C1 for flash setup, et cetera, et cetera. When I change it to change the shutter speed to 125th, for example, turn the, and this is what he's experiencing on the GX8, turn the camera off and back on, the settings always reset to the defaults. Yes, that will continue to happen, that will always happen, and this is by design. So the way that the custom functions work, and what we're talking about here is these mode dials here. So you've got, uh, there we go, C, come on, angle that so you can see it, there we go, C1, C2, and C3, and when you set it to C3, uh, on the camera itself, I realize that the microphone's in the way. And when you set it to C3, C3 on the camera itself, you can then choose between C3, one, C3, two, and C3, three. So you have five custom modes, five custom settings. So what the custom setting is, in case you're not familiar with this, is it is a, a frozen of virtually all the settings in your camera. Your, whether you're an aperture or shutter priority, what your aperture and shutter is, what your white balance is, what whether you're in single shot or multi-shot, um, except for things that are controlled by physical dials. So actually I said the single shot, multi-shot on this camera is controlled by physical dials, so that would not be saved in the custom setting. Um, I don't know what else. If you're shooting video, whatever, um, uh, frame size, frame rate you have chosen, all of that gets saved into a custom setting. So what you do is you set up your camera the way you want it. Okay, this camera is now set up for the exact way that I want it for X shooting situation. And then you go into the menu, C1. And then whenever you spin the dial to C1, that's what pulled up. Now, when you're in C1, you can change anything you want. But as soon as you either power the camera off and back on or go out of C1 and come back into it, it restores back to the C1 default settings, what you have set. This is by design. This is what it's supposed to do. So if you're playing with it, making a change, and you now want to save that change, you go, oh, I found out that the 125th of a second works better than you know, 150, whatever. Then you have to rewrite that. You have to save that into that custom function setting again. So that's that's how that works. It's by design. That's the way it's supposed to work. So it does still do that because that's the way it's meant to work. Uh, examples of how it would be used. I've, I occasionally do a little bit of real estate photography. Um, I actually haven't done it on this camera, but with the GH4, I had one of my custom settings dialed in for the way I like to shoot for real estate, which means I'm shooting JPEG because I'm shooting uh, in camera HDR, right? Actually, I take this back. I had two different settings. One that was JPEG with in-camera HDR, where I did a little bit of shift. I found the built-in HDRs went a little green, so I pulled a little bit of green out of the image. Um, a self-timer on there. I'm trying to think of what else. Well, with the aperture and shutter speed that I wanted. So I would basically put my camera on a tripod, spin it to, I don't know, C1 or whatever it was. The camera's ready. That's it. Push the button, takes the picture. And then I'd go to C2, uh, shooting a bracketed image in RAW. And I did those as backup, which I almost never used. But they were there in case... You know the built-in uh, VA uh, built-in HDR HDR was crappy, so I had that as an option. Um, so even things like the preview, right? Normally I don't want the image to preview on the display on the back after I take a picture. That's horrible. I don't want that happening. But when I'm shooting the real estate stuff, put the camera on a tripod, push the button, 
give it two seconds, it fires off the sequence, it creates an HDR, and then I want to see that HDR. I want to see it right away. So I no longer have to hit play because I have stored that into a custom setting. It comes up, I can look at the image and go, mm, I need to change something, do it again, or perfect, move on. So there's the answer to that. A couple of other people have tagged me here. Cobblesticks is saying, um, hey, wondering if you have advice on the best budget gear for video to go with the GH5, including extra batteries. Um, and uh, what am I missing that'll make me a million, million pounds? <laughs> well, you're missing a million pounds. Um, Silly is saying, can you clarify, will the 400 megabit update enable the 10-bit 422? That I don't know. I do not know. That would be something that Sean would have talked about because he knows those specs and I don't, I don't remember what those were, what the specs were, so sorry, Silly. Um, clarification on what the 400 megabit update will do. I don't know. So call us back to your question, budget gear for video. <sighs> When it comes to video, don't go budget. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you want to save money, buy used. That is that is usually going to be my recommendation. There are certainly third-party lenses that are very, very good. Um, the Sigma Art lenses being some of those, but they're not necessarily that much cheaper, I don't think. The Sigma Art lenses are really nice lenses, so not really any cheaper. Uh, maybe a little bit, but... If you're trying to save money, buy used. That's really my recommendation. If you're looking at a setup, say you're gonna, man, this is my camera, this is it. Now I gotta get lenses, but I'm low on cash. Buy used. You can get really, really good used glass out there, especially handy that there is, for example, the 12 to 35, that there is a Mark II coming, which means there's gonna be a great used market for the Mark I because plenty of people are going to want to upgrade. So these will be on the used market. If they're not already, very, very soon. So that that's really it budget-wise. Outside show kind of a budget video so again you know it's, it's hard to go budget when you're shooting with this gear you really want the good stuff because you got this amazing camera you don't want to put a crappy lens on it right you can't use crappy lighting you need to have good lighting you don't want crappy sounds so you got to buy a good microphone yeah stuff adds up um it does it does uh dennis is saying according to panasonic's official schedule no 4k 60p 10 bit internal no 4k 60p 10 bit okay uh there's a link 43attic.com you can search that. I don't know. Again, I'm not going to speculate on things that I don't know 100% for sure on. So we'll just leave it at that. All right. Back to Miro's very long list of questions. Number six, is there a one touch 100% zoom in playback mode? The GX8 zooms in by double tapping um, the display, but unfortunately not to the 100% setting like my Nikon body does. So no, the GH5 does the same thing. If you double tap on it, it'll zoom you, zoom you to 2x. Uh, you can use the spin dial on the back to zoom in farther. You can zoom all the way into 8x, but there is not a one-touch way. However, the whole um, zooming into 100% thing, that's risky because what you're looking at on camera when you're zooming into 100% or zooming in at all is you're not looking at the raw file. You're looking at the embedded JPEG file. And the embedded JPEG on the Lumix cameras, and I haven't verified what the size is on the GH5 yet, but on most of the cameras, and this probably hasn't changed, it is not a full size image. It's, I think, 2048 pixels. Well, I, I could be wrong on the size, but it's smaller. It is not a full size JPEG. I believe on high end Nikon cameras, and again, I could be wrong here, I'm not an Nikon shooter, obviously. I believe that they do include a full resolution, full size JPEG embedded in the raw file, which means that you can zoom into 100% to check sharpness. Um, you don't have that on these cameras. And that's that's not uncommon. Most cameras do not embed a full size JPEG. So you're 100%, if you zoom in 8x, the image gets a little pixely because you're kind of zoomed in beyond what it can do. So I hope that helps to answer that question, uh, Mr. Miro Nick. Okay, next up, last question from Miro. Number seven, is there a way to configure the playback options in the menu so they stay that way. Pressing the display button by accident changes the settings every time on the GX8 and makes the usage harder than necessary. Okay, so what he's saying, at least I believe what he's saying, is when you're in playback mode, and let's go ahead and switch back around. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it, let's do this. Um, let me actually get an image up here to play. That'd be probably a good idea. Okay, here's that fabulous picture that I just took. Uh, back to here. Okay. When you're looking at the back of your screen, you have the display button on the back of the camera. You can push that to cycle through different views. What he's saying is there, as I'm understanding, is there a way to force that to stay in one place? No, the display button will always cycle it through. The good news though, is that the display button is now harder to accidentally bump. It's Some have said that it's too hard to hit. Um, it, it is flush with this, so it's a little, probably takes a little more effort than you're used to to hit that, but it is also harder to bump. So, you know, you've got, you know, I don't know what, what's better, to be harder to hit or harder to bump. 
that's up to you. But uh, but that is not changed, so you just have to hit that display button, or if you hit the display button, it does change. It does cycle through the viewing modes. All right, Whew. that was a lot of questions. Next up, from APN TV. Uh, let's see here, there was a two-parter on this. Let me make sure we got this. Mm, oh, <laughs> right, okay. Uh, it says, a quick GH5 question. I recently bought a Lumix GX80, or G80 slash G85. I got very frustrated by the record indicator on screen, which flashes on and off during the recording. Because uh, he's looked at the screen a moment of times, happened to glance at it when the red light was flashed in the off position and hit record thinking he was starting to record, but actually in effect that started, uh, that stopped recording. Interesting point, interesting point. Now, no, first of all, there is, that is the same on the GH5. There's no way to change that. So there's, there's the simple answer to the question. Um, and I looked, I pulled out an old Canon camera, uh, my 5D Mark II, the first one that did the video. And I looked at that and sure enough, the red light on there stays on solid. He goes on to say that he's had lots of professional video cameras in the past, has never seen this before. Uh, interesting, I, I, I had never really thought of that as being a problem, but I can certainly see how it could be. Fortunately, there are other indicators on the camera. There is a clock, a count up clock, showing you how many seconds you've recorded. Plus there is a writing to memory uh, icon that comes up on the screen. So you do have other indicators other than the record one, but it is a fair point. The record light does flash. So if you glance at it very quickly and uh, you happen to glance when it's in that flashing off mode, then you might think that it is not recording. Uh, I, I think I'm going to feed that back to Panasonic. I think that's a valid thing to be able to uh, to choose a way to set that. I mean, it doesn't seem like it'd be a hard thing to write in. So very interesting, very valid point, and I will uh, I will bring that up. Okay. Ah, Serge asks, and I believe that Serge is here with us today, um, are you using or have you been using earlier a monopod when shooting video? In your opinion, is there still any use for monopods with the great image in-body image stabilization and lens image stabilization. Same question for those handheld pendulum-based stabilizers. So basically a poor man's um, gimbal. Are those actually for, are, the, are those actually for GH5 and IS lenses? Just wanted to hear your opinion. Okay, so uh, the first part of the question, I, I, I don't remember when the last time I shot with a monopod is. I just, I don't, ha I actually do have one. It's sitting in a corner somewhere um, with a lot of dust on it only because I don't like having this honking thing hanging off of the camera. Uh, the the need for it is certainly less with the improved stabilization. That's, I think that's fair to say, uh, but it's not, you know, holding it, no matter how hold steady you're holding it, even with stabilization, it's not a tripod, right? You still, if you really want that full on locked on, it's not moving, then a monopod can be a very good thing. When I was in Mexico, we hired a, a photographer who came with us for a day to shoot some video, and I saw her doing something really, really interesting. She had a monopod with her camera on it, which obviously, you know, she had it extended out so she could hold it at, at normal shooting height. But that made shooting down low difficult. So what she would do is she'd flip it upside down and with the monopod could hold the camera quite low to the floor to get ground shots. I thought that was kind of cool. The shots were upside down, so in post we had to flip them. Obviously that's easy. Uh, I thought that was kind of cool. So. If you're used to shooting with a monopod, there's less of a need for it, I'll say that, but if that is still, if that's the look and that's what you're used to, I don't see why that would necessarily change. You probably still wanna shoot with a monopod. But that's just gonna be a personal shooting with it and seeing how you feel. Do you do you feel like you still need that stabilization or are you okay without it? So so that's the easy answer to that. Um, the the As far as the pendulum stabilizers, same kind of thing, you know, gimbals, whether they're motorized gimbals or the, the balanced ones, that's going to add even more stabilization. All right, any of those things are going to add even more stabilization. So, personally, I've I've I don't own a gimbal. Um, I've used them on not on the GH5 GH series cameras, but I'm using them on smaller ones with the GX85. Uh, was I, I I can I think makes one the balance. It's a real that is it's a cool little setup, man. That thing is solid. Uh, Really, really neat, and you know you you are able to get shots that you probably can't get no matter how good the stabilization is because you kind of can swing it around more. You get more of a swinging type of emotion. If you're walking, you know you really can stabilize the the bouncing. You know the camera stabilizes for handshake, but it can't stabilize this, right? If you're walking and bouncing, it can't stabilize this. So people get very good at walking, kind of crouch and and walk lower so the camera doesn't move as much. 
But a gimbal certainly helps facilitate that. And uh, and I mean, I think they're great. Gimbals are pretty awesome and they're getting cheap these days. And you can get some really good ones for very little money. So needed, less needed, but if it's the shot that you want, it's a different type of shot, so you may still want it. Hopefully that answers the question. Search. Okay. <sighs> Let's see here. <clears throat> uh, Quentin, and oh, I think we kind of addressed this already. Um, let me see here. Yeah, Quentin was asking about lenses as well and specifically what lenses should I get for the type of work I'm doing. One of the things he points out is he'll be vlogging with the camera and a tripod with him in front of it. So, you know, camera on a tripod doing this or whatever, uh, which is obviously one of the cool things about this. You can flip that around and, you know, you get your, your personal shot. Pardon me. Um, the 12 to 35 will give you a field of view that at arm's length, you can be completely in the picture. If you're put a little bit farther away, obviously you can get more of you in the picture. If this is how you're shooting, the 12 to 35, the 12, you kind of need that 12. If you have something that's longer than that as your widest, you're probably gonna be a little bit too close for comfort. I remember doing a shot with a 25 mil lens where I did one of these and it was definitely too close. Like, dude, seriously, back off. Uh, so that was, that 25 is not, wide enough. The 12 is good. I would call that a minimum. If you want to go wider than that, if you got to go handheld, then look at some other lenses. Um, I have not yet shot with the 7 to 14 on here, but I would think that's a little bit too wide to do the vloggy style and you don't get anything good on the long end, but um, but it's worth considering. It's worth looking at if you want to do that really up close and personal. But I think that the 12 to 35 is a minimum width for personal up front, up close and personal of vlogging. Okay. And that was Quentin Moore's question. Next, two more. Mark Laurent says, uh, Laurent that, sorry, sorry about that. Mark Laurent that says, um, oh, right. I remember seeing somewhere that the GH5 would show the reason for the grayed out menu items. You saw that here, or you might've seen it somewhere else, but I showed it here. Um, if this is implemented on the firmware version you have, could you please demonstrate it on one of your next videos? Oh, sorry, I didn't, I'm not gonna demonstrate it, but um, it is there. It's not for every menu and that's, I don't know why. Um, hopefully it's just one of those, hey, they, they could still write a lot more of these. But uh, no, it's not on every menu. So you get to some gray menus and it's just gray. Sometimes you get to them and it tells you why it's gray. It's a great feature. I wish it was on all of them. Hopefully that will continue to evolve. But, um, but it is there. It's just not everywhere. All right, last one on here. Mr. Randall Pike says, hi, Mr. Joseph. Thank you so much for your videos. They're awesome. I thank you. I have subscribed. Thank you. And would like your channel. Thank you. Uh, so I'm not randomly speaking. <laughs> I'm going to get to the question. <laughs> uh, ah, I have a question about Facebook Live. I'd like to go Facebook Live with my Nikon D800 with a radio show. Okay, so we're talking streaming now. Uh, for a, with a, oh, all right. This is the confusing part of the question. Go live, Facebook Live with my Nikon D800 with a radio show. So not picture. How can I do that if the Epiphan, we're talking about the Epiphan, um, not the Pearl, but the, the lower budget one, the webcaster, doesn't work too well for audio. My audio my audio has to sound right, clearly. What are your some uh, for streaming hardware now we're talking? Primarily I'd go live and record what we do so I can edit it later. Thank you so much for your reviews, yada, yada. Okay. The webcaster X1 that I had in here that I never got to work right, never worked right with my cameras. They actually have a list of known configurations that do work. It turns out that it's quite finicky and there are, absolutely there are cameras that work apparently perfectly well with it. I've had reports, people have commented here saying, well, mine works fine. I've had people say here, mine doesn't work at all. Same thing that you're getting. And Epifan has confirmed again, that there are some cameras that it works with and some that it doesn't. If you ask them, I don't think this is on their website, but if you ask them, they will share with you a list of known compatible cameras. I, I would think this would be on, maybe it's on the website by now. I shouldn't say it's not. Maybe it's on there by now. But uh, there are known compatible configurations. So if you are doing this, you can buy that and, and put it together and, and get to work. I have no idea if the D800 is on that list or not. Not a clue in the world. So there's that part of it. Um, as far as other streaming solutions, the webcaster was by far the, the most affordable stream. What else are your options? Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you two things. I'm gonna tell you what little experience I have with other streaming hardware, and then I'm gonna send you somewhere. If you go onto Facebook, there is a group called Oh crap! Live streaming, not li live. Damn it! I'm gonna look them up. Facebook Live. There's a whole group. Live streaming pros. There we go. Live streaming pros. 
check them out on Facebook, Live Streaming Pros, and they do a daily live stream about live streaming. They have all kinds of information and advice on live streaming, hardware, configuration, lighting, cameras, everything else. And they will, uh, you can hire them to help you set up your live streaming studio. So, live streaming pros, check them out. They can tell you way more than I can. What I can tell you, webcaster, minimal support of what actually worked. Uh, the cheapest way to do live streaming that I know of is to get OBS, which is a software, open broadcasting system software. It is free because it's open source and you can run that on your Mac, which you presume, or PC, which you presumably already own, and you can stream from there. So you don't have to buy extra hardware. If you're looking for a dedicated hardware device, things uh, from companies like Teradek can work very well. Although as many of you longtime viewers know, I have I've had many, many issues with the Teradek Video Pro in the past. I have every intention of doing a complete and full reset and restore on it because I really want that thing to work. It's been too unreliable for me though. Um, but they do offer, and that's a thousand dollar hardware piece of hardware, and they do have lower versions of that as well. Um, and then you get up all the way up to something like the Pearl 2, which I've done testing here on the show. We've already linked to that, so click the I uh, and you'll see the playlist for that. And that is a obviously much higher end at eight thousand dollars to go up to 4K. I think it's a little over six thousand if you're doing HD, and it is a really, really nice high end hardware streaming solution. The second part of his question is talking about editing the show, about um. I just hope that audio wasn't coming through. I just realized that thing was playing audio. Someone would have yelled at me. Um, the uh, part of recording it for editing later. Now, this is something you have to be cautious of how you set up to do. So this show, right, I record this show. Usually, I forgot to hit record today. doesn't matter. We go live. Um, uh, I record this on an external recorder. I used to edit the show and then post that. I would turn off the front and back of it. Now, we're doing that editing live, if, uh, not live, but um, in Facebook and YouTube. In YouTube, you have the ability to trim off the end of a show, so that's what we're doing. Now that we've got the quality of the program that goes to air good enough, where I don't, I no longer feel like I need to record separately and upload. But the recording separately and uploading that I was doing was to a dedicated recorder. You could use something like your Ninja Assassin, you could use on the lower end, um, what I was using was a Blackmagic, uh, what's this thing called? Um, um, Hyperdeck Shuttle 2, and it records to SD dri drives, so um, disks, whatever, solid state, um, SSD, not SD, SSD. So you can record to this, and that records ProRes. So now you've got a really, really high quality stream. But your, config your hardware configuration has to support this, right? Mine works this way because I can do multiple program outs from my ATEM, and I can feed a dedicated feed into this, and I get full ProRes capture. If you're trying to do a kind of more budget, um, one camera operation, whatever it might be, your camera may or may not record internally while outputting on the HDMI. So that just depends on the camera model. So that's something you have to watch out for. Your streaming hardware or software may also record for you. But, and this is the big thing to watch out for, that device, for example, the Video Pro, while it will record to an internal uh, micro, SD, or, yeah, micro SD card or SD card, it records the same thing that's being streamed. So that means if you're streaming to Facebook, let's say at 720p, that's what you're capturing to the cards. So if you're trying to capture a higher resolution version of the show, you cannot do that there. You'd have to have a separate feed to do that. So that's something to consider. That um, Blackmagic device that I just talked about, we'll put this, we'll link down to it below as well. Um, it has a pass through, so I could feed, let's say, let's say I'm doing a one camera show, I could feed from the camera into that device and then pass through that device into streaming hardware. So I could capture full resolution on there, full quality, ProRes, and then stream out whatever I gotta stream. So that is a solution for that. Hopefully, Randall, that helps. All right. I did see my name fly by a couple more times. Let me scroll back a little bit and answer those, and then we are going to move on. Uh, let's see here. All right, here we go. So Terry has said, what is the inside info on the rumors about the Panasonic camera division? I addressed this in the beginning of the show. I will address it again only to say, and you can go back to the beginning of the show to watch it from the start, only to say fake news, right? It was all based off of, all the rumors are based off of an article on a Nikkei website which itself is speculation based off of a, an announcement back in September about a minor restructuring that Panasonic, maybe it's a major restructuring, but it's a restructuring that Panasonic is doing, has zero to do with the camera business being shuttered or anything stupid like that. The camera business is full on strong. It is simply reporting to a different division than it did before, which is what the Panasonic announcement back in September said. The Nikkei article is 100% speculation and then the Micro Four Thirds rumors that have popped up are simply jumping on that bandwagon. So 
no truth to it whatsoever. No camera manufacturer in the world is gonna put all the money and time into developing a camera like this just to shut down the division. This is a massive, massive camera for Lumix. This is their flagship, right? This is the big baby. We've been waiting for this for a long time. We've got it now, but they're not going anywhere. So there's that. All right, uh, let's see here. There's that. Let's see what else is up here. Uh, I guess I answered more than that than I said I was going to. Fake Cubed says, I hope you do a show soon on your FN button layout and camera settings you use for specific kinds of photos. I did add it to the list. We will. The reason that I'm not going to do it right away is because I'm still playing with it. Uh, I know I had a layout that I used for the GH4, but the GH5 has other buttons, other options, other commands, and so I'm still playing with it a little bit. I will tell you, though, that I am basing it off of the GH4 layout, which, let me see here, um, let me do a quick GH4 setup, uh, I forget the name of the website, Suggestions of Motion. If you go to, or Suggestion of Motion, just Google search GH4 setup, it's going to be the first thing that comes up. Uh, the fellow that runs that had put together a very comprehensive, very, very well done list of how to configure your GH4 for video. I have started with that and I'm modifying that for this camera for my own personal use. And I will absolutely share that. And the cool thing is, once I've kind of really got it dialed in, I can save the configuration file and I can share it with you. And that's a tiny file so I can put that on my Dropbox and a million people can download it if you want to. Uh, so I'll do that, I will. But I need more time with it to really figure it out. Even this morning as I was playing with it, I go, oh, I don't have this dialed in anymore. I changed this so that's not there so I had to add another custom function. It just takes time. So I, I will do it, I will do it. Because I think it's really interesting. Um, and, and that's the way it is. Um, all right, let's see here, what else? Dennis says, uh, we'll use, I will use the GH5 for our first feature film. Nice. We'll shoot the most stuff internally. 10-bit codec seems really solid. Great. With the V-log and sharpening turned down, this camera seems almost perfect. Well, there you go. Not even a question. I concur. <laughs> the camera's awesome. It really, really is. Uh, I know it had come up before. Do you still need an external recorder like a Ninja Assassin? Obviously, you're, at that point, you're recording to ProRes, not to MPEG, so you do have a a uh, not uncompressed, but virtually uncompressed signal. Um, I remember, it's an interesting thing. This goes back, oh boy, this would be 2007 probably, maybe six. So a decade, a good solid 10 years ago when I still worked at Apple, I was doing presentations at IBC. This is the, the NAB of Europe. So IBC is in Amsterdam. And we did a side-by-side -side of ProRes 422, yeah, we, I think we started with four, ProRes 444 and then did 422 and then did the LT. We're showing all the different codecs next to a split screen next to a full uncompressed. And it was uh, the image, I remember the video was a kind of a ticker tape parade type of thing. If you know anything about compression, you know that the more stuff is moving, the harder it is to get a clean compression. You get, that's when you start to get artifacts. And the side-by-side -side, all the way down to the LT was virtually indistinguishable. And certainly at the high end, you could not tell the difference. It was remarkable. So ProRes is virtually uncompressed video. So if you need that level of quality, you plug in a um, uh, an Atomos Ninja Assassin or Ninja Flame, I guess is the new one, or a Shogun or whatever, and you get that full, beautiful ProRes image. It's phenomenal, but all that said, the MPEG that is captured internally is still very, very good. It really just depends on what you're doing with the image, how far you're gonna push it, whether you need to record externally or not. Plus the external recorder gives you a nice big screen to look at, it's easier, it's always easier to check focus, um, to see everything when you're on a bigger screen. That's just, you know, bigger is better in that regard. So I personally will still shoot with the uh, with the Ninja. I'll probably upgrade to the Flame um, uh, sooner or later, but for a lot of the shooting, I will still do that. But of course, you know, you can't beat this the quality you can get just this little setup right here well not that lens i would have this lens on here um in fact i went out this weekend tried i hiked our local table rock trying to get sunrise there was no sunrise sun never came up um i will i have a video on that that i will release uh, either today or tomorrow i did a little editing on that on the ipad and i'm going to talk about that because that was kind of an interesting experience um editing on the ipad for that which you could do it's pretty cool uh, anyway this right here that is an insanely awesome rig right here this is bitching okay that was a question that wasn't even asked that I just answered. All right, um, let's see, anything else? Oh my God, oh, my name's flying all over the place here. Um, any idea what the video specs are in 6K photo mode? Oh, it's, well, it's MPEG-5. Is it 411421? That's a good question, I don't know. Um, please repost that as a question, as a comment rather on this video once comments are open or later um, because this live feed will go away. So add that as a question and I will look that up and address it because that's a good question. I don't know the answer to it. 
Uh, fake cube saying, yeah, the configuration file really handy. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so what he's talking about here, what I already mentioned, you have the ability on the GH5 to save your configurations to a configuration file on the SD card, which you can then copy to other cameras, you can share on the internet, whatever. When I had the GH5 a month and something ago, I dialed it all in the way I liked it and I saved it. I saved because I had to give it the camera, so I saved the file. I never copied the file to my computer and then I reformatted the card. Oops, so that's why I'm starting over again. But it's okay. It's okay to start from scratch. Um, I should get my hands on some anamorphic lenses, Fuse is saying. Agreed. Uh, lots of other stuff to do too. Uh, Quickshot is saying, will I be doing some low light stills tests? You want to see what the ISO will do? Yeah. So I started to do some tests. Um, I need to do a lot more. And it's, uh, I know, I'm, just, I'm a little behind on there. I, I will be doing a lot more tests with the camera now that I have it in my hands for good. Uh, I'm sorry that I'm a little slow on this stuff, but I will do it. Oh, Rumblock has answered the question. 6K is... 10-bit 420H265. Well, there you go. You no longer need to post that question. There's your answer. So 6K photo mode is 10-bit 420H265. Thank you very much, Rumblock. I appreciate that. Okay. Let's leave it at that. That is today's show. Um, whew, man, almost an hour, and I got a meeting in 10 minutes. So thank you very much, guys. Appreciate that. These these morning uh, Monday morning Q&A ones are definitely going to be the bigger shows, but uh, hopefully educational and interesting to more than the people who just ask the questions. We had a good live count today. Good, excellent. We said not over 100. We did break 100 once. That was really cool. Um, but this was 75. That's pretty good. I dig it. Uh, that was no concurrent. That's 75. Now. Oh yeah, 75 now. Sorry, reading the wrong numbers here. Thank you very much. Um, oh no, there was. Hold on, there was a question that I missed. Where did that go? Okay, I, I only reason I remember it is because the thing's sitting right here. I don't know why I missed it when I was scrolling through. I must have scrolled past it. Someone had asked about my little configuration here. So let me move this crap out of the way and talk about this a little bit. So this is a DIY thing. Great, I need this. A DIY thing that I did. And let me, uh, let me pull something up here real quick to talk about this thing. Um, ba -ba -bum, media. Okay, I have to wait for that to load. Um, this is a platform that I built for uh, I didn't build it for tabletop, but it turned out to be really, really, really useful for that. I actually built it so that I could put a camera or a light on the floor. Because if you get a, a light stand, you got a studio light, you put on a light stand, light stand's high. Even the lowest setting is still pretty high. You can go out and buy lower ones, but even those are still pretty high. So what I came up with was this platform. So it's just a piece of wood. I have two different versions of this. Um, with a, let's see, take off the ball head here. This one here. There we go. This is the simplest one. Platform, piece of wood. Let's go to this camera here. With a hole. Focus, focus. There we go. With a hole, right, on that side. And the other side has a recessed. So to do this, you need to have the right tool to do the, the recessed. I have no idea what that's called. I'm not a hardware guy. But anyway, to do that. That allows me to take a 5.8 16 um, screw, put that in, bolt, put that in there. And now it's flush, right? So now we we'll go sideways here. Okay, I, well, the camera's too low. But anyway, it's flush. You can see that there, which means that I don't need, and I know part of the question was, are there feet on this? And there are no feet on this, see? So this can now go flush on the table. That goes on the table flush, and now I can attach whatever I want to to this. In this case, I was attaching my little uh, Manfrotto ball head on here. Super handy. The other version of this that I built is here. And this one does have the feet on it. So let's go back to this view. So this one does have feet, and I put four feet on it, um, you know, for each corner. And this one has, and I'm sorry, I don't know what these things are called, um, but it's got this screwed in uh, permanently. Like, this is hammered in. So I can take the same 5.8.16 screw, put that in, put that in. There we go. But you can see it's not flush, but it is also a bit more secure. This one over time, I could wear through that hole and you know break that out, but this one does not. This is now not flush, hence the need for the feet, and it does like that. Now, this bolt that I just put on here is too um, short. I have longer ones, so you can attach things to that. So now, at that point, you can attach a monopod, I mean, a, a ball head to it. The other advantage of this one, what I've done, because it's got the threads in it, is, I don't have one in here, sorry, but you know the standard studio posts that has a, um, a light stand post in it, you know, like this big, and it has a 5.8.16 on one end of it, that will screw directly into this. So I can take that post, screw it in, and now I've got a post here that is super solid that I can put my light on 
and now I've got a studio light that I can put on the floor. So that's what this is for. So two different versions. And if you want to see more about how this guy was made, this is what I was pulling up before. This was actually part of my DIY course at lynda.com. So if you go to lynda.com and just search DIY in Photo Joseph or type in photojoseph.com slash DIY, it'll take you right to it. And this was a really, really fun series. And it was a, it was a whole, um, we did two different series on it. I think there's maybe 30 to 40 videos, and there's a lot of videos. Some of them are real short and simple, some of them are much more complex, but it's all about DIY photo stuff. It's really, it was fun. And that's where I, I built these. Um, so I had access to cool tools to do the like drilling of the recess thing. So um, anyway, so that's the answer to that. Check that out at lynda.com, please do. And don't forget, if you are not already a member, you can get a 10 day free trial by going to photojoseph.com slash lynda, and then it'll give you 10 days for free. And then you can check that one out along with all my other stuff. All right, I did see my name fly by one or two more times. So let me grab those and then we're definitely out of here. Um, oh, just someone saying, have a good day. Fake cube, thank you very much. I've got a call in five, so I got to go. Thank you, everybody. That was a great show. Don't forget to support the show by going to Patreon, that thing that just popped up down there. I saw the core of my eye. I didn't even have to look. Uh, photojoseph.com slash Patreon is a great way to support the show on a ongoing basis. Um, otherwise, just like, share, blood, tell everybody, tell your friends. Thank you very much, guys. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.